thanks for coming to this book launch event. Uh, I'm very happy and honored to, to convene this uh, uh, book launch the, uh, on, on a recently published book by Margherita Grazioli. Margherita is a postdoctoral researcher uh, uh, in the area of social sciences where I work um, uh, in the Grand Sasso Science Institute. The Grand Sasso Science Institute is a university, uh, a state-funded uh, university in Italy uh, dedicated to uh, PhD education in different fields, uh, such as physics, computer science, uh, mathematics, and uh, social sciences. Particularly, we offer a, a PhD program in regional science and economic geography. There is uh, there are uh, uh, seven uh, vacancies in uh, uh, for studying uh, for doing a PhD that are still open until uh, mid June. So, if you are interested or disseminate uh, uh, this uh, uh, PhD call. Um, uh, uh, Margarita's book uh, is titled uh, uh, Housing, Urban Commons and the, the Right to the City in Post-Crisis uh, Rome. Uh, it has the, the story of uh, the metropolis, a space that was quoted uh, a few years ago, and is also an example of uh, uh, engaged uh, ethnography, uh, or uh, the way she calls it, uh, activist uh, uh, ethnography. She has spent a lot of time doing research uh, in this, uh, uh, doing research and being an activist at the same time in this uh, um, uh, in this metropolis uh, space um, uh, i'm very happy uh, to to have here uh, three uh, um, international guests who will uh, comment on 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 the book uh, there are uh, uh, three distinguished uh, scholars uh, who have uh, uh, done uh, excellent research we identify them as uh, 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 as invited speakers based on uh, on this on their uh, scholarship on uh, on the subject uh, particularly of uh, the urban commons which has been uh, a very um, exciting uh, field of research within the the, the last five uh, ten years uh, i would say the the the, uh, the issue of the urban uh, commons and the politics of the urban commons so uh, I'm very happy to, to have here uh, Amanda uh, Haran. Amanda is uh, an associate professor at the University of uh, District uh, uh, Columbia in uh, Washington uh, uh, DC in the United States. She does research on uh, uh, affordable housing, the urban commons, and the historic and contemporary geography of uh, Washington DC. She has published recently a book on the urban commons, which uh, I recommend, the title Curving Out the, the Commons on uh, Tenant Organizing and Housing Cooperatives in Washington DC. Then we, we have uh, uh, Elsa uh, uh, Noterman. Uh, Elsa uh, works in the, uh, she's a junior research fellow at Queen's College of uh, University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom in the geography department. Uh, she holds a PhD in geography from the University of uh, Wisconsin uh, uh, at Madison in the United uh, States. She uh, just uh, very recently obtained her PhD uh, from the uh, University of Wisconsin. And she uh, does research particularly on, uh, uh, we were interested in her research on uh, uh, legal and illegal geographies of property and, uh, and, uh, and, and, the, and the commons. Then uh, we have uh, uh, Professor uh, Miguel um, uh, Martinez. Uh, who is uh, uh, based in the Institute for Housing and Urban uh, uh, Research at Uppsala uh, University. Um, um, uh, Miguel does research on urban commons as well as on urban social movements more generally. He recently published a book on uh, squatters in the capitalist city. Uh, so, um, I would leave the, the floor now to, to, 
to Margarita for uh, her introduction uh, uh, to, to her book. And then uh, we will have uh, uh, the, the, the comments by our uh, invited uh, speakers. And then there will be a, a short rejoinder by Margarita herself. And then uh, there will be a, a discussion with, uh, uh, with comments from the audience. Thanks, Margarita. I'll leave you the, the floor. Thank you, Hugo. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Just give me a second to share my screen. Hopefully, it will work. All right. So uh, I will just try and start the presentation mode. OK. All right. So first of all, thanks, everyone, for being here. I am really excited and uh, kind of nervous about this because this is my first uh, uh, book launch and uh, I'm really glad to do it with the cooperation of such uh, let, uh, a competent board of panelists. So thank you so much, Amanda, Elsa and Miguel for, uh, join, for joining us in this. And uh, yes, today um, I will start from, uh, let's say, framing uh, the book I've just recently published uh, uh, with Paul Greg Macmillan about the story uh, of, uh, of Metropolis. Uh, as uh, Hugo anticipated, uh, the book is based actually in uh, uh, my activist ethnography inside this uh, uh, housing squad that I will frame in a second. Actually, uh, my field work uh, and activist experience started at the beginning of 2015 and it has, uh, continu and it has continued ever since. Uh, the first part actually of my uh, ethnographic work, let's say uh, until 2018 was condensed uh, in my PhD dissertation uh, uh, that uh, I was awarded at the School of Business of the University of Leicester. And then it continued and the further uh, results and data were uh, included uh, into, into this book. Even though uh, I have to say that uh, as happens with probably every type of ethnography, I have already new data and stuff that I wish I had included inside the book, but at some point you have to crystallize something and that's what I did uh, inside my book. Uh, my ethnography was actually an engaged one, uh, being an activist uh, inside the uh, Blocchi Precari Metropolitani organization. I think it was uh, important also to uh, introduce the, uh, the organization where uh, I've been an activist because it's really relevant also for the development of Metropolis. Uh, Blocchi Precari Metropolitani is a grassroots organization that uh, was, let's say, formed uh, or it appeared in the city for the first time in uh, 2007. So it has a very different temporal and ideological descent uh, in comparison to other uh, housing rights movements in Rome who had been present inside the city, obviously in different capacities, at least uh, since uh, uh, the 70s. So uh, we could say, and this is very pertinent uh, actually to the case of Metropolis, that uh, uh, the politics of Blocchi Precari Metropolitani are rooted uh, inside the contemporary economic and housing crisis. Uh, actually, the um, organization emerged a few months before uh, the 2008 um, financial crisis actually erupted, but we could already see uh, their builders uh, somehow in the city uh, and also, I mean, globally. And so that was the moment when uh, Blocchi Precari Metropolitani emerged uh, as an organization. Uh, together with the, the Coordinamento Cittadino di Lotta per la Casa, an organization that has been present in the city since the 70s, they formed the uh, Movimento per il Diritto all'Abitare. Uh, it was a bit tricky to translate this in English because uh, uh, there's not an exact uh, translation for it, but we thought that the best possible translation could be a uh, movement for the right to uh, habitation to, uh, let's say, um, uh, 
to, to show the more comprehensive vision about housing that uh, emerges from uh, places like uh, metropolis. So what uh, Blocchi Precari Metropolitani has been concerned with uh, since uh, the foundation has been what they call the uh, urban unionism for the right uh, to the city. And uh, it, within this idea of uh, urban unionism, uh, reappropriating housing is considered as the point of departure for demanding multiple rights, connecting to being settled, moving and mobilizing uh, inside the city. And so it was two years after that uh, uh, Blocchi Precari Metropolitani emerged as a political act, uh, uh, actor in the city of Rome that Metropolis uh, was uh, occupied. But what is Metropolis uh, actually? Well, for starters, uh, it is uh, a, a former salami factory. Uh, it is located uh, in the neighborhood of Tor Sapienza that uh, nowadays is uh, considered as a semi-peripheral area. I'm saying semi-peripheral because um, actually it is uh, on the inner border of uh, Rome's ring road. So it's not uh, considered, let's say, as the furthest point in the infinite urban sprawl of uh, Rome's fabric. But let's say that it is a, a peripheral area uh, actually. And uh, uh, this was a, this salami factory was discontinued at the end of the 90s by um, the, Fiorucci, the Fiorucci company that decided to uh, move uh, the industrial plants elsewhere, one part in Pomezia, uh, other parts of uh, uh, the meat processing uh, um, uh, industry in uh, even abroad and and then uh, the area was uh, let's say uh, abandoned this is a very huge uh, uh, area you have to consider that all the parts uh, of uh, the, um, the salami production was made uh, inside this place uh, so um, it, the, the area was later uh, bought by uh, the Salini in Pregilo firm. Uh, many of you may know it as one of the prob or probably the biggest Italian engineering firm. Uh, nowadays, uh, it has changed names uh, in uh, WeBuild, but uh, uh, it's the same thing. And actually, uh, the Salini in Pregilo firm was in the process of uh, asking some uh, modification to uh, the, to Rome's uh, regulatory plan to uh, implement uh, uh, the, the demolition basically of the factory and uh, the construction of a new uh, residential and commercial complex. Uh, uh, the full plan was not uh, uh, very clear because uh, at the time they were still in the process of trying to uh, obtain what is uh, uh, called in Italian uh, a change of uh, destination of use, family uh, destination d'uso. So uh, while this process was ongoing and basically the factory was uh, in that state of abandonment of degradation, it was uh, uh, occupied on the 27th March 2009 by uh, families and individuals in a condition of housing deprivation uh, together with uh, the activists of Blocchi Precari Metropolitani. Uh, nowadays, the factory uh, houses uh, 45 uh, households. Uh, I'm using the word households because uh, uh, they might be singles, they might be families with kids, or just people who wish uh, to, to live together and to share the same uh, housing space. So uh, households not to be too, let's say, entrenched in the family lexicon. And these uh, 24 families form uh, what they call the, uh, the Città Meticcia, the, the, uh, the Mestiza city. Uh, uh, these, uh, and who are the people who actually live uh, inside metropolis uh, uh, nowadays? Well, it's a very mixed uh, composition uh, from which the self-definition of the 
Mestiza city. There are, uh, there are Italian uh, uh, households, especially, uh, let's say, people with uh, um, very uh, precarious uh, jobs, uh, some of whom uh, actually uh, are artists, uh, precarious workers uh, in different sectors and whatnot. Many people also, uh, let's say, employed uh, in, uh, uh, let, in what are called informal economies. Uh, there are uh, 30 families actually um, who are um, of Roma ethnicity who entered in a metropolis uh, two years uh, after it was occupied uh, as a consequence of the eviction of the camp uh, where they were living before. And then there is another vast component of uh, migrant people with different statuses, uh, who are mainly, we could say, from uh, South America, especially uh, Peru and, uh, and Ecuador. And then African people from different areas, uh, Maghreb, but uh, um, also Sudan and whatnot. And I was saying with uh, different statuses, because you could have people, uh, let's say, with uh, um, a job doc, with a visa related to work, but also uh, asylum seekers and, uh, and refugees. So this is a very mixed. Uh, uh, composition and these are the people who live uh, uh, inside metropolis uh, uh, nowadays. But actually, definition of the città meticcia can work in two ways because there is uh, the, let's say, uh, obviously the housing uh, theme, the housing issue that is the reason why uh, this place uh, uh, was uh, occupied. But then uh, these, uh, uh, let's say. Um, the environment of the factory, the fact that uh, it was, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a piece of industrial archaeology that was now taken care of by this very uh, peculiar composition of urban inhabitants who had used uh, the original parts uh, of the factory and uh, the original spaces to make their own housing uh, uh, units. Uh, favored the encounter with uh, uh, a group uh, of uh, uh, anthropologists, actually, and of scholars, uh, especially from the Roma Tre University, who had formed this group of urban trackers who would actually walk on the streets uh, uh, of Rome and uh, uh, speak about them. And as they were walking, uh, uh, on the Prenestina Street in 2009, they encountered this place and they found out that the ex uh, Fiorucci factory was, uh, uh, was occupied. So what happened was that some of them decided to start uh, an art uh, uh, an art project uh, with uh, the inhabitants uh, was a realization you can see uh, in the um, document in the web doc uh, uh, space metropolis uh, which is uh, fully available on uh, youtube and then some of them actually decided to to stay and make this uh, experiment uh, kind of permanent if we can speak uh, of being permanent uh, uh, in a place like Metropolis that is, of course, under the permanent uh, threat and scare of eviction. But uh, let, this uh, encounter between uh, uh, artists, video makers, anthropologists, uh, um, BPM activists, uh, and uh, um, the inhabitants of Metropolis, first and foremost, brought to uh, the idea of uh, uh, of using part of uh, one part of the factory first and then permeating the old factory and also the housing space with pieces of art that have formed what has been called Metropolis Museum of the Other and the Elsewhere. Uh, that uh, opened in March uh, 20, 2012, so uh, basically three years after uh, Metropolis uh, was uh, uh, firstly occupied. And then it had, and ever since it has been uh, hosting guided visits uh, uh, on a, a weekly basis uh, every Saturday. So if you, uh, if you are in Rome and you want to visit uh, the, the MAM, you can, uh, you can go on Saturday, uh, Saturday mornings. Uh, of course, uh, during this uh, pandemic uh, period, uh, this did not happen, but let's say that with the exception of uh, uh, the lockdown, it has been open uh, on a weekly basis ever since. And why uh, do we need uh, um, 
would you need a guide to visit the place? Uh, well, just think about the fact that over 500 artists have been donating their pieces of art uh, to, uh, to Metropolis and the MAM. And they are located in different areas. They are located in the body of the factory, but they are uh, also inside the houses, the corridors in many different uh, locations. And they are pieces of art of different natures from sculptures and statues, some of whom, uh, some of those from uh, artists who are uh, known uh, uh, globally like uh, uh, Piscoletto. There are paintings, there are pictures that are the graffiti, first and foremost, those that you can see on the facade of Metropolis performances, temporary pieces of art, whatever you can think of. And the idea, the purpose of all these pieces of art is to create Metropolis's barricade of art, as it, as it is called, that is made by the pieces of art themselves, but especially by the, the relationships, the social and political relationships that they foster. Uh, also, Metropolis was very involved in the brief experience of the, the Macro Asilo. Uh, the Macro Asilo is the Museum of Contemporary Art uh, of Rome. It is in the city center and it, uh, uh, it, was, it has been related to Metropolis for these two years because the artistic director of the Museum of the Other and the Elsewhere was nominated the director of the MAM. So for two years, you had uh, the inhabitants of uh, uh, Metropolis going there on a very regular basis, joining events, organizing events, and also donating some pieces of art that were literally uh, moved and transported from uh, uh, the from Metropolis uh, to the to the Macro Museum and then back to to Metropolis when uh, the Asilo uh, experience was concluded. So as you can see, this is a very complex uh, uh, experience. Uh, it brings uh, uh, a unique character, but I guess, uh, I believe it can be also uh, generalized and it speaks uh, uh, to a broader debate about the commons uh, and the right uh, and the right to the city and about um, current, the current value of uh, housing within uh, urban uh, social reproduction. So that's why I have decided to uh, adopt this uh, ethnographic angle to uh, explore uh, the story of Metropolis, even though uh, this is uh, also an hybrid ethnography, meaning that uh, I've used, I've pulled, let's say, from uh, uh, themes uh, and debates and scholarship that is within uh, the economic geography field uh, that uh, the, the social sciences area is nurturing. Uh, I've pulled, uh, again, from uh, anthropology, from uh, uh, urban studies, housing studies. Uh, this is, uh, I would say, um, it has been a quite a transdisciplinary journey for me and a very complex uh, uh, one because I did not want just to tell uh, the story of Metropolis uh, or to let, uh, but I wanted um, the voices of the activists, the inhabitants to resonate with the importance the richness of their experience and the value it brings uh, for the city and, uh, and even for um, field of studies concerned with the urban, even beyond, uh, let's say, uh, the extraordinary character of their everyday life. And this is, this is uh, this attempt is reflected in the book uh, in the book structure. There is a first chapter that is the introduction. Then there is a theoretical chapter where I try to frame why housing squats uh, like Metropolis matter, why they are not just uh, hubs uh, of housing uh, emergency. And then I dig into some uh, concepts uh, such as neoliberal urbanization. Uh, I try to see how housing squats are read through existing taxonomies of informality and squatting and how they are not reflexive or only partially reflexive uh, of the characteristics of housing squats in Rome, then how the experience of housing squats had to rethink the right to the city theory, as well as the connection between the experience of housing squats uh, and the theorization and practice of the urban commons. 
Then in the third chapter, I detailed the, the activist ethnographic method uh, I use. So uh, say, stating my uh, positioning within uh, methodological debates concerned with uh, uh, the role and function and supposed neutrality of social sciences. I discuss my positionality and the practices, the practicalities of research, data collection, and also dissemination, as they are all entrenched uh, in that relational uh, uh, ethics that uh, um, permeates, let's say, my uh, work uh, as an as an activist uh, researcher. Then, in the fourth book, I framed. Uh, Rome as a squatted city where uh, informality and different forms of squatting have emerged uh, at least since uh, uh, the first part of the 20th century. Uh, also to, to, draw, uh, as, to draw a line uh, uh, and to draw also a connection between what happened during the 70s and the differences with uh, the current uh, composition, the current demographics, we could say, of the housing crisis. And also how um, the multi-level governance of the city has reacted to the revamping of the squatting phenomenon. Then uh, in the following chapters, I addressed the uh, uh, let's say the experience of metropolis, especially through uh, visual materials and the interviews with the inhabitants uh, based on, uh, let's say, um, three different uh, uh, temporalities. Also, we could say uh, moments uh, uh, and specialities of metropolis, uh, the, the story of the neighborhood where it is made and then uh, how the squatters actually uh, uh, decided to join housing rights movements and what preceded the cracking in the place. Then the everyday life of metropolis entrenched in those organizational rights that were already part of the repertoire of housing rights movements, but then were uh, updated to uh, cope with uh, the new uh, social composition of housing uh, rights movements. Then the politics of metropolis on different scale from different scales from the local to the city level also to uh, the transnational one as well as the macro ex uh, asylus experience and uh, the last chapter is the conclusion where uh, i wanted to rediscuss also some uh, uh, let's say uh, potential lines of future inquiry pertaining to uh, the squad's uh, resilience during the pandemic, how uh, their organizational rights and forms of uh, living adapted to uh, the, the pandemic scenario. And also, uh, let's say the chapter anticipates some uh, questions and lines of re research that I wish to develop in the future about uh, uh, post-pandemic scenarios in housing policy making as they could be affected by um, the next generation EU and from its Italian application through the uh, national plan of recovery and uh, resilience. So this is kind of the structure of the book and that would be it from my side. So I will, I thank you for your attention and I will leave the floor to Hugo and our guests. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Margarita, for your uh, excellent uh, presentation of the book. And um, uh, we'll leave now the floor with the following order to Amanda, Amanda Haron, uh, uh, followed by Miguel Martinez, and then uh, Elsa Notterman will uh, end uh, uh, the comments. Okay, uh, Amanda, if you are ready, you can, you can start, please. Great. Thank you, Ugo and Margarita, for inviting me. Um, and I really um, am so happy you wrote this book, Margarita, because um, I just think it's really, really interesting. You're taking up some really interesting ideas. And I just, I love the way you approach the ethnography and just the very rich details that emerge, particularly through the long, um, the long direct quotes from the people who you interviewed. You know, I just thought that added so much to the story. Um, so yeah, and I'm delighted to be uh, speaking here with Elsa and Miguel as well. So it's really um, lovely to be here. There are, there's, 
I'm thinking in terms of my comments, there's a few um, themes that emerged that I thought were particularly interesting um, that I thought I could touch on here and that I think I'd be interested to hear what other folks, um, the other panelists and other people who are here thought of, of these things. Um, so I'll just, I'll just dive into that. And I um, wanna apologize. It is, there's a huge um, cicada uh, eruption going on around me outside my window. Um, there's an incredibly loud buzzing noise of insects totally surrounding me. It's amazing. So I don't know if you hear that in the background, um, hopefully not. So I think one of the things um, that I was particularly interested in in this, in this work was this question of centrality versus periphery. And I think, you know, when we think about how the right to the city has historically been understood as you described very well in the book, um, it really is about the right to centrality, both, you know, spatially and also centrality in terms of democratic decision-making, participation in all sorts of urban processes. Um, and I just think that, uh, I mean, I've been thinking myself more and more about what, you know, what is the role of the periphery? Um, and, and indeed it seems that this, as you described, Tor Sapienza had, um, was a former urban fringe. I mean, it's, it, looked, it seems like it's sort of more on the edge of the city. Um, and, and so, so I think your work really helps make us question this, this dichotomy between center and periphery. Um, and when we think about urban studies, you know, this sort of relentless focus on the urban, whatever that means exactly, <laughs> um, and the sort of central urban, and even, you know, fetishizing the fetish of the city and how that comes through in so much scholarship as well as in real estate, you know, um, investment. And, uh, and property regimes. So that kind of fetish of like the city, you know, the, the interesting, cool central city um, and, and profit generating central city. So I think your work does some interesting stuff in terms of um, thinking about the role of the periphery, especially in the urban commons. And in particular, because I think, you know, when we think about the commons and sort of how commons can sort of be developed, reclaimed, regenerated, um, you know, so much of that is connected to, to waste and to like waste lands and waste space. And obviously that's, I, I think what's going on here, this abandoned factory, you know, it's this sort of, you know, waste space in a sense on the edge of town um, is what people have taken over and really created into a really rich common space. Um, so I think it's interesting to sort of think about the urban commons as not um, necessarily part of the center, but really as a, a product in some sense of the periphery of the wastelands, um, where there's more room to kind of create a life together, more room, a little more room to experiment. Indeed, it seems that Tor Sapienza, as you describe, um, you know, originally was this collectivist socialist experiment um, that and it seems like that was able to happen again because it was kind of on the edge of town. And so that to me, that theme of kind of the relationship, I guess, between centrality and periphery was kept coming up in your work and I thought was really interesting. Um, and uh, I mean, in one, in one page, in fact, you write, you describe as claiming the centrality of the supposed periphery, you know? So I, I just think it's a very interesting kind of relationship there that I'd love to hear more about your thoughts on that and other people, there are other panelists thoughts on that. Um, so that's, that's one theme that came up that I thought was fascinating. Another thing, um, another theme that emerged was this question of this really diverse group of strangers coming together through their collective labor to create this space. And so the role, yeah, the, the work of social reproduction really is what you're talking about here. Um, working together in their housing across their many differences. I mean, it's, it's fascinating to me the, the you know, this Mestiza city as you describe it and the, um, the many different places that these migrants and Italians, you know, people coming from different places, many different places they're coming from. Um, and they're just sort of the solidarity, it seems that they build together through working together on this obviously common need to have a home. And related to that collective labor, I think is this question that's always interested me about both squatting and also housing cooperatives that I've studied is this question of the politicization of the people involved 
and the degree to which um, you know, people have a political consciousness around the work that they're doing um, and the degree to, you know, sort of what we even mean by that, by kind of what does it mean to be political per se? Um, and uh, does it really matter? Or, you know, I mean, I'm just sort of really interested in those questions of, of the politics of this. And I think, you know, clearly a lot of the folks that you interviewed um, had a, a political meaning, kind of a larger theoretical framework, I guess, a larger political understanding of their work um, beyond quote unquote, just the need for housing. But um, yeah, I mean, and one of the things I'm curious about is, is did you, you know, did you know, were there people there that you talked to who didn't really have a polit, you know, a, a politics per se about it? Um, that, that, that all, all of that, I think is really interesting to, to kind of dig into. And, in my own work, I've seen more that, you know, the leaders of these cooperatives are kind of the, the, the tenant organizing, the folks who are really doing a lot of the work um, might have a more kind of political understanding, a sort of larger framework for what they're doing. But a lot of the folks involved didn't necessarily. Um, and and I, I don't think that's good or bad. I just think it's interesting to think about like, what is, what, what is the politics of the people involved? Um, and again, to what degree does that matter in terms of the forming of the urban commons. <laughs> um, so this question of kind of the labor of the commons and the politics of folks involved, I think is, is really interesting. And then the other um, thing that you talk about, which I think is also very interesting is the temporality of the squats, of the, of the squat um, and of the commons and these kind of different phases that you describe that they went through in creating this space, you, know, you, clearly, you clearly kind of demarcate these different phases um, from when the squat was founded until today. Um, and you also write that there, that, that, that Metropolis is, is related temporally to larger scale housing movements in Rome. And I was, I was curious to hear more about that, like how, yeah, the sort of like temporal relation to these, these other housing movements that are going on um, yes, I was curious to, to hear more about that. Um, so yeah, this, this idea that there is a lifespan to the squat, you know, it's, is interesting to me and, and to the commons and that it is not, of course, we all know it is not a static thing. It is constantly being regenerated. It's, it's the social labor of people who create common spaces and, and continue them. Um, and yeah, so one of the things I'm, I, I think about too with that is, you know, we can talk about extending the commons to other spaces, but, you know, are there points at which a commons disintegrates, you know, it, it dies? Of course there are, <laughs> there's lots of examples all around, but, but what is that, how does that um, relate to, you know, these sort of what we might think of as failure of the commons, you know, um, how does that relate to other commons elsewhere to other movements. So I think this, this question of temporality is, is really interesting. Um, and then I think the, the final kind of, maybe not the final, well, the final big theme that I thought was really interesting was this, this question of the role of art in the whole thing and the, um, the museum. And it really, I'm gonna put a link in the chat. It really, um, it sort of reminded me, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Amy Staracheski's book, um, Hours to Lose When Squatters Become became homeowners in New York City. She writes about this. Okay, so I'll put a link to that book in the chat too. If I'm sure many of you are familiar with this book, but um, in case you're not, um, it's an ethnography of um, squatters in New York City who decided to become legal at a certain point and what that process was like, which I thought was fascinating. But so one of the things that she writes about is this museum of, what is it? Museum of um, Reclaimed Urban Space, which was begun at really coming, not so much an art museum, but more kind of coming out of the archive of these squats, the squats had created for themselves. But similarly, it's this public facing, you know, attempt to kind of educate the neighborhood and tourists to New York City or whoever's interested about this really rich history of the squats in the Lower East Side of New York. And, and I just think that that um, effort that you describe um, in your book, this museum that's really, it seems like the purpose is to kind of, both to protect the squat, which I thought was fascinating. I mean, you write about how the inhabitants um, 
describe that when visitors come, it's they they and they of course there can be a kind of zoo-like gaze, which can find like not so great, but it also sounds like there's this there's this way that visitors, the the external gaze of the visitors also helps them feel protected from um from harm, I guess, in some way. And but then there's also this educational purpose to the museum. Um, oh, oh, you know what? I'm sorry, I'm looking at the I'm chat. I'm just forwarding it now, no worries. Okay, I, I put it just to the panelists. Sorry, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you, yeah. And I'll put the um, museum, the museum link in the, um, in the chat as well. Um, yeah, and, and so, um, yeah, but this, this idea of the role of the museum as both a protective space and an educational space, I thought was really, really interesting. Um, and then I think just a couple other thoughts. One, just from your slide just now, this, um, and you had of course written this in the book as well, but this um, reappropriating housing is the point of departure for demanding multiple rights connected to being settled, moving and mobilizing um, inside the city. I just think it's so interesting to think about this concept of the right to stay put and the right to kind of stay in place in relationship to the fact that most, I think, I'm not totally sure, but it sounds like most of the, of the inhabitants of the squat are migrants. Um, and, and, and so there's also this, when we think sort of larger scale about, about people's relationship to place, there's the right to stay put, but of course there's also very importantly the right to mobility. And of course the people who are in that squat, many of them are coming because they needed to leave their home countries for whatever reason, and they're seeking refuge in Italy. Um, and so I just think that kind of dynamic is really interesting more, more broadly in urban studies and in thinking about the kind of right to the city is this idea that the right to the city is not just the right to stay put, but it's also the right to mobility and to, and to movement, um, especially when we look a little more broadly at the you know, global scale. Um, so I appreciated that you included that, that it's, it's the right to be settled, but also to move. And I think that's an important point for urban studies um, and for thinking about urban change. Um, yeah, and then I guess I guess my 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 question also for you is I'm just so interested in this. I think this kind of goes back to um, one of the things Miguel said right before we got started. But I'm really curious how this book um, you think it could be used potentially by the folks at Metropolis um, or just by people more broadly. Like what your vision might be for how this work could be used by people in Rome, um, in Metropolis specifically, or in other you know, housing movements around the world. Because I do think there's so much to be learned from this book, um, both theoretically, but also in terms of people's actual work, in terms of um, reclaiming, reclaiming space in cities. So thank you very much for writing this book. I, it was obviously a, many uh, years of effort and work, and I think um, I'm really glad that you've done it. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda, for your very insightful comments. And uh, I will leave the floor now to Miguel and then uh, uh, Elsa. Thanks. OK, thank you very much. Um, it's my pleasure to share this session today with you all. I don't know how many minutes we have. Um, allocated for each of us, but please. 15. 15, okay. More than 15. Anyhow, just let me know when I'm close to the 15, because I think I have like six pages of comments and maybe uh, I'm, it's definitely, I cannot raise them all. So let me start by congratulating Margarita. We have been meeting for many years, um, and joining as quick meetings um, and sharing other works and I'm following her work. And I think this is a wonderful book. I really enjoy it very much. Um, I think it's, um, it's a good case study uh, as, as the one Amanda mentioned and many others. I think that's perhaps one of our uh, 
strengths and weaknesses at the same time in squatters, uh, squatting studies, if we can say that, that we really love to do case studies and to be very much in depth. And this is probably due to the fact that we are, many of us are very much involved or were very much involved in these experiences. But I understand that being um, a squatter uh, is usually very demanding. Uh, so I can understand Margarita's um, struggles to write and to be active at the same time, because that's the same as many of us also experience and is very demanding, um, exhausting somehow. So this is also just to acknowledge uh, that, that this deserves um, a good congratulation for achieving rights in the story of your life uh, over all these years, right? I think the book can, can be helpful for many people, but um, I will discuss later also the issue of how can be helpful also for activists and, and squatters who are not so activists, but they are also involved in, in these struggles. And that's a more problematic thing. But I, I think for academics and, and for the whole world, the book is, is useful because at least it's uh, telling once more that the squatting and squatters are not uh, evils are not demons, are not people trying to destroy society. I mean, it's people who are basically questioning injustice, people who are struggling to overcome many, many hardships and lots of circumstances that are really terrible in our society, especially on the housing field, but not only that, it's also about the city. And, and that's, I think the, the book contributes very well to that. Um, and that's, it's something I'm always trying to find when I read about the squatting. Not all academic writing on squatting is about that, but I think they should achieve that because it's an important ethical and political commitment in society. And I think the book is portraying a very positive image of squatters, and that's also very welcome. Um, then um, I have so many comments that, well, I think the, the book has many strengths. I mean, uh, Amanda mentioned the, the, the role of art and the role of the uh, museum within uh, such a squad, a house in a squad with lots of migrants, lots of poor people, people who are basically surviving almost every day on a daily basis. And then all of a sudden they, uh, make an alliance with uh, artists and cultural workers and so on. And this is really remarkable. I mean, it's, it's not very useful, especially when it comes to squatting for housing. It's more frequent when there are social centers and the working class composition is not that big, that much. But when it comes to housing, uh, it's a migrant spots. That's a completely different picture because the, the hardships of people, the vulnerability of people, are really incredible. So I think this is also a remarkable, um, uh, important point of reflection in the book, which um, I think this engages also with the reflections of social centers, but Margarita probably tried to avoid that kind of engagement in order to emphasize this new alliance, which is also fine, but well, perhaps, um, that could be also developed <laughs> more. Um, yeah, um, I think I also like it very much, um, this um, reflection about the BPM, the um, Precarious Metropolitan Bloc, the, this group of activists, which is quite important in the amazing development of Metropolis. I mean, I didn't mention, but I was in Metropolis. I was visiting with Squeak in 2014. We had a visit, an organized visit, a discussion, an assembly with the activists and with the people living there uh, almost one day. And uh, it was incredible, basically. I mean, I visited many, many squads all over my life in many countries. And I think Metropolis was something you, you can never expect, that kind of alliance, that kind of dynamics, vibrancy, but at the same time, safety and many diverse people living together. That's not easy at all. It's quite, quite complicated. And I still don't understand how they manage. So after reading the book, I think I understand a little bit more 
but I still don't find all the clues, all the, <laughs> the, the tactics, all the things they did. And probably this means that Margarita knows much more than is in this book. And she didn't tell us the whole story. That was my guess all the time, like, okay, I'm missing more, I'm missing more because she probably knows what's going on. And that's part also of my criticisms I'm going to develop later. But uh, I think that's, that's very impressive, the, the achievement of Metropolis, um, especially in terms of uh, putting this diversity together. I don't agree much that they are strangers. That's something I, <laughs> I mentioned to my comments on Amanda's book. Uh, and also Margarita is uh, with the same idea. I think when it comes to squatting, there is a process, uh, and even if with co housing cooperatives, in which people start to get in along together step by step. Of course, it's not always like that. Sometimes people all of a sudden jump into a squat because they need it. And, and of course, you need to be integrated, and, and sometimes you do. But that's not the usual process. I think you become more and more familiar <laughs> because this is um, a way to create trust. You cannot squat and being completely open to everything. And that's also another concept that Margarita is controversially using very often because the museum is open to people. All social centers are open, but squats, as most urban commons, need to be bounded, need to be need to create a community and need to create um, good um, and close relationships within the community. It's not a strict, a strict boundary, but of course there is some important boundaries and rules that reinforce that community. So um, sometimes uh, I think in the book, the, this is very clear, but sometimes it's more blurred when it's, Emphasize is this openness of the of the place. So we all know that there are barricades that are not precisely to be <laughs> to allow the place being completely open. That's for some reason, for safety and for many other things. So let me now go to a few critical comments, if I may. <clears throat> um, Oh, sorry, I forgot to add another positive thing that I, I really like it when telling the story about Rome and about Mediterranean cities and Mediterranean urban planning, urban making and homemaking, especially the real estate market is that, and I think this is quite important for understanding the, the rationale behind squatting is that there is a lot of uh, corporate or white collar or middle class and upper class illegalities. So it's not the squatters, the only ones who are illegal. I mean, you are illegal because you are forced to be illegal, but there is a huge, huge illegality in urban issues and planning. And that's something that Margarita is just mentioning a few times, but this is really a strong argument for um, creating the grounds, the rational grounds for such a collective and powerful collective action, such as squatting. So I really appreciate that too. Thank you for telling again this story that some of our colleagues also mention occasionally, but uh, I think it's really, <clears throat> it's important. So uh, let's jump to the criticisms um, in the last minutes. Well, I think there are a um, few things that could be developed a bit more. <laughs> and that's why I was all the time while reading the chapter saying, okay, maybe in the next chapter, but well, the first thing I think is conflict and contradictions, problems within the, um, uh, the experience. I mean, it's a long experience. It has been successful to a large extent for many years. But uh, I mean, I've been in many squats. I've been squatting a lot. And I know that even from day one, there are conflicts, lots of conflicts, always. And internal conflicts and also conflicts with the outside, with your opponents, with neighbors, with authorities, with the owner. Um, and I think critical scholarship uh, in urban studies needs also to engage with that. I know it's very sensitive, especially if you are an activist scholar, if you are very much involved in an um, activist organization, you don't really want to air your conflicts, especially your internal conflicts. It's better not to disclose that in public. And this is a strategically understandable, of course. But in terms of uh, academic scholarship, knowledge, um, and also for the future reflection of activists, 
I think we need to reflect more on that. We need to think about conflicts, how they were solved, how they were not solved, um, and all the components and all the aspects of these conflicts. Um, and I know it's sensitive, but I, I think that's perhaps one of the weaknesses of being so much activist in an organization and doing that. My second um, comment is regarding intersectionality. I think this is a powerful issue and diversity within this uh, squad in particular, but it's telling even more. I think there is a whole, whole story here, which is, has not been told, which is about squatting is evolving. Squatting is not the same now as it was in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s. In every historic historical period, there are economic, political, social, and cultural circumstances that are shaping the way our struggles for squatting are developed. And this is clearly manifested in this new wave of squats with lots of migrants. So it's not only migrants, it's lots of women, lots of working class people, uh, lots of precarious uh, workers, unwaged workers, informality. So somehow I missed a discussion of that. I know it's present in the book. I'm not saying it's not here, but uh, I think we need to understand the global working class, the global working class movements and urban uh, unionism or syndicalism, as you mentioned before, in by understanding the whole picture, all the aspects, all the also the conflicts within different sections of the working class. Um, so I think this is um, something, at least for myself, is a, an, a very open question. I still trying to guess how to understand that in the squatters and housing movements in Spain, for example. And I think it's that it's opening um, a way of discussion in the book, but could enjoy much more sociological reflection, perhaps. Um, so what else? Um, yeah, well, I think that's another issue that perhaps is sensitive regarding your role as being part of an activist collective, a housing organization, that this relationship between uh, dwellers or squatters who are not so much involved in the organization and, and those more politicized activists um, is not always horizontal. And I can understand that the work done within Metropolis was really incredible in order to achieve that or to uh, soften all the tensions that could raise uh, in these situations. But my experience, at least in housing squads, is that um, there are many hierarchies. And, and one which is really, really difficult to overcome is this relationship between those who are more in need and those who are in less need of housing. And also in terms of experience, that's something that's one of the factors you mentioned, that, that that's perhaps is the most uh, evident one that once you have political experience or you have been squatting for a long period, then you can claim or you can help others much more. And helping, of course, is not hierarchical oppression or rule. I agree on that. But still, hierarchies are, are there, social hierarchies. Um, and sometimes they have to do with the, your skills in terms of language. They have to do with your economic and educational trajectories because you are aspiring to something else. Sometimes it has to do with your views on uh, religion, culture, politics. And so again, uh, it's part of the conflicts of uh, managing, self-managing a squad as an urban common. So, so I think that demands a little bit more of reflection, critical reflection, and also, um, uh, Something I really uh, would love to see in, in people researching on squatting is tell me, how do you fix that when, when this created more issues uh, among you, right? And um, how did you solve that? 
and solutions are not easy. In some squads, they decide to expel some people, for example. In some squads, they have huge assemblies, uh, collective assemblies to manage conflict. Sometimes they appoint the specific mediators or sometimes there are the circumstances. For example, the issue of applying for social housing, uh, which means that the, the common can disappear. That also creates a, a contradiction within the commons because you are prefigurating something. You are making your own home collectively, struggling at the same time with the enclosures, with the difficulties, with the lack of affordable housing and so on and so forth. But at the, same, at the same point, many people in housing squads are really aspiring for uh, having social housing. And to then this means to live that collective experience. And that's not the same. It's not easy to self-manage social housing once you are allocated uh, far away from your previous colleagues and so on. So um, I think the book makes a great contribution in understanding that squatting is about urban commons and it's about the right to the city. That's perhaps one of the, the few books doing that. And not many people there to um, create such a strong argument on that. Because we know that there are many issues about the squatting is not just one single experience. There, are, uh, uh, there is a diversity of uh, squats out there and not are all positive. So, but most of them are positive and that, <laughs> that's something I, I want to uh, stress again. But these kind of contradictions um, are important. Uh, and well, and to me that, that could reveal a little bit more on that. I was thinking, for example, that in terms of the, the social center aspect of Metropolis, which is the museum, the, the most open aspect to, of the, the place to uh, outsiders. This is obviously creating, enhancing the cultural capital of those who are running the museum, who are contributing, donating, exhibiting in the museum. Even if they do for free, uh, I mean, their professional careers can be, um, can enjoy benefits from that, which is not the same for dwellers. I mean, if you apply for social housing, you cannot say in your CV, well, I was a squatter before for 10 years. I was really working hard to create that wonderful squat. I mean, they don't care. I mean, the only thing you need is a score and tick, tick, tick. And then if you are lucky, you can get social housing. But for your professional career in the social reproduction field, this doesn't count. <clears throat> but for because cultural please, workers, oh yes. You, can you? I need to finish, okay. Yeah. So basically, I mean that the accumulation of cultural capital for some people is much more beneficial than for others. And that's something we need to manage. I mean, we cannot completely eliminate that, but we need to, to do something for that. And my final question was what I said, how do you think that as quarters, dwellers, activists from metropolis and from other squads in Rome in particular, can feel about your research, about your findings, about your strong arguments that you are making in the book. Thank you very much. Sorry for being so long. No, no problem. Thanks a lot, Miguel. Um, very interesting uh, questions. Uh, uh, before Margarita answers uh, uh, to Amanda and to Miguel, uh, uh, I leave the floor to, to Elsa uh, for her uh, remarks, please. Thank you. Um, and thanks again for inviting me to participate. Um, it's really so exciting to be part of this panel. I know Amanda for years and Miguel I've met recently through an activist scholarship network. So um, it's nice to be on the panel with you all. And, um, and Margaret, it was a joy to read your book. I think um, in the midst of a pandemic, um, which has amplified existing crises around the world, especially around housing, it was a real joy to read this deep attentive study on metropolis as an evolving form of experimental autonomous urban regeneration. Um, and it was energizing to follow the processes by which a former salami factory has become a collective home, a sanctuary, an arts project, a driver, a new vision of a city. Um, in carefully tracing these processes, you really take housing squats as a serious site of study, not only on their own terms, but in relation to broader practices of urban planning and development in Rome, which was really exciting to see. 
as a site of innovation in urban theory and praxis. Um, thus, while situating, situated in the particular historical and political context of Rome and the neighborhood of, please forgive my Italian, Taurus Sapienza, or Knowledge Tower, which I love that translation and is very apropos of the kind of urban knowledge that's being produced there, actually. Um, the experiences and insights covered in this book really offer important theoretical, methodological, and practical lessons for those of us working uh, and struggling in, in, in a variety of urban contexts. Um, so while there's a lot of entry points into this book, and I think it's partly facilitated by the structure whereby each chapter can both function as a part of a whole and as an independent piece, um, here I wanted to take some time to reflect on a couple of themes, three themes, three sort of overarching themes, which I found to be particularly useful in thinking about my own work and also raise a number of critical questions, which I would be excited to discuss further. And some of them definitely resonate with, with what Miguel and, and Amanda have said. So part, uh, sorry ahead of time for any repetition. Um, so the first set of reflections around the urban commons and specifically as Margarita lays out in the book, what the Mestizo city can tell us about the potential of urban commoning or the doing of the commons to offer a different vision of urban development of post-industrial spaces. So in the context of expanding work on the commons and urban commons in particular, including by the other panelists, um, grounded in situated examples of the emergence and maintenance of urban commons over time and across different geographies are critical. And I think this offers a, a really grounded example. Um, one question that Margarita frames in the book, emerging from the current movements for the right to habitation, is what it means to struggle for housing without social or council estates or social housing as an objective that can be pursued and achieved as in the past. Um, so while former uh, housing rights movements work to obtain public housing or social housing through squatting and, and activism with the retraction of council estates and a turn towards neoliberal approaches to housing, what is the new end goal? And this is a similar question raised in communities I work with in the US, um, for example, where a voucher system has largely replaced the development of public housing estates, and it is harder and harder to obtain both. Um, so Margarita offers the example of Metropolis as one alternative where a struggle for housing involves a broader struggle for proliferating urban commons manifested in forms of grassroots or insurgent regeneration where demand for housing shifts to a broader demand for urban habitation and a right to the city. Well, this alternative op offers an exciting uh, opportunity to explore anti-capitalist alternatives to austerity urbanism. I'd be interested to discuss further a concern that some scholars have recently raised about the centering of autonomous forms of urban commons means for the state provision of housing. In other words, is there still a place for a struggle around public housing or social housing? And relatedly, what does it mean when the state begins to shift the responsibility for the provision of housing to community activists? Um, so in a group of squatters, squatters I work with in, in the city of Philadelphia, for example, state officials now refer people experiencing houselessness who can't access shelters to the squatters movement. So what does that mean in terms of the shift of responsibility? Um, Another key concept that Margarita develops in relation to the framing of metropolis as an urban commons is the process of what she calls eurythmization um, or the constant process of quote, harmonizing spatial transformation with the different temporalities spanning the rhythms of daily life, which I really love. Um, this harmonization of, dis of difference within the self-proclaimed Mestizo city is partially achieved through participation in what Margarita calls organizational rights so assemblies, collective care for shared spaces and social reproduction, where this participation, participation quote unquote, trains a kind of political consciousness about the implications of everyday struggles for life and community. Um, so while, while conflict and difference are framed as part of this process, and I think this echoes um, what Miguel was just talking about, I'm interested to know more about how Metropolis's eurythmization accounts for tensions and differentials. Um, in, in commoning. So what you could call, I guess, in, the, in, in these terms, arrhythmic moments, so the, the cancellation of rhythm, or, or, of rhythm that have emerged either between or amongst activists, squatter activists, um, or housing movement activists, and then along the lines of gender, race, and cultural identity. In other words, are there differences that emerge in relation to participation in organizational rights? And if so, how are they resolved or harmonized? 
In my own work, I found that there are often different understandings and participation in commoning, even within a community that has worked together for a long time, that can at, at times offer important innovations and opportunities, but also creates tensions whereby different understandings of the commons can conflict, can create conflict, and um, can create uneven participation in labor involved in commoning, which causes broader problems. Um, given the tenure of Metropolis existing for over a decade and the different layers of participation from diverse residents, political and social activists and the public, I'm curious to know more about the emergence of conflict and the resolution of, of conflict um, and how they both challenge and or sustain the collective project over time. Um, relatedly, um, sort of I'm interested in the, the, the contradictions of urban commons that emerge and are addressed in this community. So, as Amanda Huron has pointed out in her work, urban commons are often a pragmatic practice, so emerging out of need, but also embedded within cities as sites of intense accumulation and control, necessarily forced to continually negotiate with the state and capital. This negotiation can, as raised in both Amanda and Miguel's work, unintentionally threaten urban commons, such as by facilitating gentrifying development, by raising property values. This seems to be warded off in Metropolis, as Margarita underlines, by building and maintaining connections to other commoning projects, enrolling those who inhabit the site, but also housing activists around the city who draw on deep historical roots and connections to navigate the city's political and economic landscape. In many ways, then, Metropolis benefits from and perhaps contributes to what seems to serve as a kind of urban knowledge commons. Um, developed by generations of housing activists of how to develop squats, how to maintain them through navigation of relations with the state, market, and public. So while this history and ongoing social activist infrastructure are unique to Rome, and therefore as acknowledged by, by Margarita, the replicability of the model cannot be assumed, I would be interested to know whether others in Rome or Italy or abroad have sought to emulate Metropolis's model or access the kind of knowledge commons that's been developed by housing activists in the city, both in efforts to address localized housing crisis, but also to ward off some of the contradictions of urban commoning. The second set of questions relates to the housing squad, which I think um, you, do, you hopefully set out as a, a distinct form of urban, of urban squatting to highlight and then collapse the distinction that is often made between need-based and political squatting, whereby a need for shelter allows for a kind of politicization through ongoing participation in the creation of a collective project. The double configuration of metropolis of residents and the museum reflects the relation of the provision of basic needs and broader social activism. And I found this configuration, which Margarita frames as a kind of socio-material infrastructure to be really interesting, especially in relation to the tension of visibility and legality. So often squatting remains invisible as a means of protection given its illegal nature, especially as the communities that I work with. Um, whereas in Metropolis, visibility offers protection whereby squatting becomes legible to the public as a legitimate, if not legitimized form of urban re regeneration. But I was wondering specifically how this legibility is mobilized in defense of Metropolis for example, under the threat of eviction, um, how, how are the broader connections to the public mobilized in support? Relatedly, is there a risk that this kind of legibility could shift Metropolis's alternative project or cause unintended consequences, whereby, for example, it could contribute to a form of gentrification? Um, and then finally, how do housing squats and, and particularly Metropolis address the question of potential le legal ownership? is the goal of the community to maintain what Miguel might call an anomalous institution um, belonging to the urban commons rather than the state or private ownership? Or are there forms of legalized collective ownership such as community land trust models that members of the community are considering? Given its lasting tenure, I'm interested in where the thinking is in relation to its future sustainability going forward. Um, and finally, um, the last set of thoughts is around this book as a piece of activist scholarship. Um, Miguel and I are part of this uh, activist scholar network that's just emerging now, and there's a lot of conversations about the challenges and opportunities of doing activist scholarship. So for me, this book offered a really timely and great example of, of how to do activist research, remaining committed both to intellectual creativity and knowledge production, as well as the collective political projects and ideas that drive this work. 
and thus the squatted Mestizo City offers a double configura configuration, including squatter residence and social creative infrastructure of the museum, the book in many ways also offers a double configuration, drawing together activists and academic insights in a way that creates something new. So I found myself reading it both through an activist lens as well as an, uh, an academic one, and actually sharing some of the insights of the book um, with squatters that I work with in Philadelphia, um, specifically around the, the barricade as a socio-material infrastructure. Um, I was also particularly interested in your positionality as an activist and academic, and kind of at times where it seemed to be the synthesis of an activist academic, and whether tensions emerged in navigating these positions throughout the project, both in how you were perceived by others in the project, and whether there were times you felt compelled to step back from, from your position as an academic and or an activist. Where you, where you just sort of step back or step forward, which is something that I found in my, uh, in my own work, found myself doing. And then also how you um, maybe have mobilized sort of uh, the privileges and that, that come along with your position as, a, as an academic um, for, uh, mobilize those privileges for um, your work with Metropolis. And I'm specifically thinking of um, the undercommoning book by Fred Moten and Stephen Harney, which talks about basically stealing from the university in order to you know, help uh, social movements and activism. Um, I can put a link to the book in the, in the chat if folks are interested in. But so where are those times when you're both, the, your positionality comes into conflict, but then also how you're able to mobilize these different um, positions um, to move this project forward. And then lastly, I guess, is sort of the next steps. I'm interested in how this book fits into uh, the Metropolis project going forward. So in the book, you reference collective discussions of the book project and the benefits of sharing knowledge about Metropolis. And I'd be interested to know beyond its important contributions to ac uh, academic scholarship. And you know, this is something that Miguel mentioned too, you know, what are the, the, the benefits sort of beyond, the, beyond academic uh, contributions? So what are the goals for this book? What are the audiences for this book um, beyond academic scholars? Um, and you know, I can imagine that perhaps it's, it's an effort to build a broader support, perhaps, perhaps an additional layer of barricade <laughs> For the metropolis project um, to hold and also to hold up the knowledge of this space and perhaps to inspire uh, similar efforts elsewhere but i would be interested in, to know from your perspective and also from the perspective of um, the metropolis um, residents that you shared this work with about sort of the intentions for this book going forward um, so yeah thanks again for the opportunity to reflect on this this book with you today and i look forward to having discussion further about it Thanks, Elsa, for your uh, comments, for your great comments. And uh, now it's time for Margarita uh, to address the issues raised by, uh, by the panelists. And uh, um, please, Margarita, if you can uh, offer your rejoinder. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for your engagement with the book, for this very insightful comments and feedback and also I would say I mean, sensations and emotions it's very a lot and thanks for engaging this much with the book and you have asked us so many interesting questions comments and inputs that I could probably spend time with you for hours going forward but I will try to sum up and group some of the themes that emerge from your questions and then I would be obviously happy to uh, develop it later also with you uh, individually uh, as well and uh, so I, I've tried to group the, uh, the questions in this way. I, I will start probably from uh, one of the, uh, let's say, theoretical point, even if it's not, it's theoretical slash political thing raised by Amanda about uh, claiming centrality versus uh, the life of the of the peripheries. Uh, actually, this is uh, um, this is one of the main themes uh, also in uh, the political action of uh, uh, Blocchi Urecari Metropolitani, and this is something we've been reflecting a lot 
uh, I was mentioning before when we were offline that actually Metropolis during this week has been uh, involved in what was called uh, the Festival of Peripheries and actually a big part of the day uh, dedicated in Metropolis was meant to deconstructing the idea that Metropolis and places like Tor Sapienza are the peripheries and I'm actually developing more on this topic. This is one, for instance, one of the things that I wish I could have developed better in the book and that I'm doing now, because the more I dig into the, um, let's say, urban planning history of Rome, the more I realize that actually uh, neighborhoods like Tor Sapienza were never the actual peripheries, or at least they have not been. Uh, for the peripheries meant as a... Uh, uh, let's say peripheral places where things are happening at least since uh, the, the last the last century because um processes of displacement of inhabitants from the city center started even during the fascist regime so uh, they're very old and so if we think about and and so basically there is this one thing about the fact that uh, the so-called peripheral neighborhoods are the places that are actually inhabited and the pandemic was, a, let's say, a magnificent and terrifying prism for that because you could see the city center completely deserted during the lockdown period and the pandemic. I always say this anecdote, there was this rule at some point that if you need to go 300, that you could go grocery shopping only 300 meters away from your house. In some central areas of Rome, you did not have a grocery shop within uh, 300 meters because those places are meant now for tourist consumption, services and whatnot. So first of all, this is one thing about thinking about the peripheries. And the second thing was, and the second thing is uh, also entrenched in the debate about urban decor and so top-down urban regeneration as a way of embattering also peripheries. While pushing processes of gentrification. Well, it, it doesn't make any sense to speak about degradation of peripheral areas because they were thought exactly to be uh, in this way. So they were uh, conceived, planned, uh, we could say ill-planned uh, in a sort of way. So the, the point is exactly that people are trying to uh, make uh, their lives better in those, in those places. So even speaking about uh, urban decor or degradation of the peripheries doesn't make a lot of sense. So this is something I've been reflecting on about centrality and, uh, and periphery too. Partly reply to what Amanda was saying because this is a suggestion and this is a reflection I'm currently making. So I might be a bit confused on my inputs, but that would be it. One macro theme that I think emerged from all of your intervention is the issue of conflict, what is political and also of political relationships inside the uh, inside metropolis and other uh, housing squads. Uh, I think that one element of distinction uh, about uh, Blocchi Precari Metropolitani in particular, but not only, I would say, is that uh, all of the uh, more recognized activists uh, are all housing squatters in other places, not in metropolis, but they are all uh, housing squatters in, uh, in other places. So there, there is not such let's say, an ontological distinction between the activist and the squatter in this case. Of course, there are different degrees of politicization that would, uh, that would emerge. In this respect, it was very interesting to hear from all of you questioning what is political at the end of the day, because yes, if we speak um, about the different engagement, let's say in city politics, uh, in the weekly assemblies of the uh, movement for the right uh, for habitation, in uh, writing political documents, organizing events and whatnot, of course, you can see uh, a sort of, let's say, um, separation or different degrees of engagement that, depends on, that depend on many different things. 
uh, also uh, been uh, the different migratory status can affect uh, one uh, uh, person's availability to engage or to risk or to jeopardize their status, let's say, during an illegal uh, action, even though even squatting is illegal. So, uh, but of course, I mean, probably there are different sets of uh, uh, illegality that one can think, uh, can think of. But um, the point for me would be that, yes, so you have this distinction in the level of uh, political engagement, although there is a ground level for everyone that is guaranteed by, by the assembly that is made on a weekly basis. This is why I was stressing this much that you can tell that uh, a housing squad is not in a very good internal and political position when they don't do assemblies on a political uh, on a on a regular basis because if they don't if uh, the dwellers don't meet for a long time this means that something is not working because uh, the assembly would be the place where internal conflicts are handled to reply to to miguel actually uh, the assemblies are the place uh, um, where problems are solved. Of course, in some, uh, let's say, very serious cases, uh, the, the dwellers can decide that someone has to go. I'm speaking especially when there are cases of uh, gendered violence or violence against against kids, uh, these kind of things, they, uh, they are not uh, tolerated. So people are asked to leave when these kind of things would happen. And this brings me to the issue of what is political, because if, again, if you're speaking about the engagement in the, let's say, the politics of the movement, yes, there are different levels. But I think that probably the more uh, distinctive political elements in the squatter is that even though they wouldn't frame it as political, as feminist, as anti-racist or whatnot. I mean, the, the fact of uh, sharing uh, childcare, of sharing care work, or of uh, uh, like socializing the fact that uh, taking care of the elderly, of kids, uh, of sick people is not something that you need to solve within the walls of your family, but it's a collective matter. I think that's profoundly political. And for those who have stayed uh, in the metropolis for a long time, uh, this is something that is uh, acknowledged pretty much by everyone, which brings to two of the points that were raised that are the fact that sure, the composition of people who live in metropolis have changed over time. There have been people who have decided to, to move out. I would say that the core nowadays is yet made by people who actually really need the uh, housing. And I'm saying this also because there was a, a turnout of dwellers that came also from the eviction of other housing squads that were not part of the housing rights movement or that were part of that and that were uh, evicted, especially since 2016 uh, uh, onwards. So nowadays we have people who actually need uh, housing. Obviously their residential trajectories and ambitions could be different. Actually uh, pertaining to the application for social housing, uh, Blocchi Precari Metropolitani encourages people to uh, apply for public housing, uh, even though there is a specific Italian legislation that forbids uh, uh, squatters to apply for public housing for uh, five years, and uh, that is a part of that uh, national housing plan that I mentioned uh, uh, in the book through the uh, Article 5, so there is this issue. And this is a question that uh, as activists, we ask on a regular basis uh, with sorts of um, with the discussion during the assemblies or also with uh, a sort of poll because on, let's say, um, on a yearly basis, we make a sort of internal census to see how many kids are there, how many families, how many people to have the, the, the exact numbers. And during these conversations, we ask people, would you like to apply for social housing or do you wish to stay here because these uh, these changes of course the type of demands you will do once uh, the eviction threats will become uh, more uh, more concrete uh, because of course i mean the threat of eviction is always present it, it, probably after the pandemic these uh, threat of evictions will be uh, more 
uh, more intense. Uh, so uh, some people would wish to get uh, a public housing accommodations, others would like to, to stay in metropolis and there could be uh, a policy framework for this thing. Uh, in Italy, it's called auto recupero law, is a self recuperation law. It's a law that uh, uh, exists in the Lazio region and also on the city level of Rome. Uh, the few times it has been applied, no projects uh, were, uh, have been completed. So, uh, this is one of the problems. You have the legislative framework but uh, the city council and the region are not very consequential in bringing them forward. Uh, they work through a cooperative of the inhabitants that uh, decide to renovate the place under the framework of the city council. So there would be a framework uh, and that could be a, a, an option. Uh, not uh, on about the controversiality of openness that I think relates um, also to uh, what, acti what people would think of my research, my positionality and all the different positionalities involved um, in Metropolis. Of course, the, uh, this is, a, the, this is connect, very connected to the point of conflict, internal conflict, external conflict, engagement or disengagement with the uh, rest of the squatting scene. Um, of course, I mean, uh, Metropolis is uh, included in the network of the Movimento per il diritto all'abitare, so they have very close relationships with uh, the other housing squads all over the city. Um, also with those who are not, let's say, part of the movement, because you, in Rome there are over 70 buildings that are currently spotted for housing purposes, and not all of them uh, are part of uh, housing rights movements. So that's a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of buildings, and in these cases there are community, ethnic, uh, kinship uh, connections that work to uh, create these uh, um, let's say, uh, nets, uh, uh, net, net, networks uh, and relations uh, and so on. There is a relationship with the, the social center squad in scene, not so close, even though uh, close to Metropolis, there is one of the biggest social centers uh, in Europe, I think, the Forte Prenestino. So there is a relationship with the local squatting scene uh, but uh, this is a, probably a point that I could develop better besides going into the, the differences uh, uh, about that. And uh, this brings to the last point I would say that is the issue of openness, the issue of my, um, let's say, positionality, how is research perceived, how is an activist like me perceived, uh, and so on. Well, I have to say that when I started writing this book, but probably my PhD dissertation, I used to be very confused about uh, what to do. Uh, it was also kind of awkward uh, to me uh, because I actually, especially uh, during, uh, I, I wasn't living there at the moment. I was staying in, in another place, in another um, squatted place, but I wasn't living in Metropolis. And in general, it was very uh, weird for me to deal with uh, like the practicalities of data collection, like recording someone asking questions. It was very weird for me. I have to say that in these cases, uh, the dwellers of Metropolis especially have helped me a lot because Metropolis is also a peculiar story of uh, rela of encounters and relations with ethnographers, scholars, and whatnot. So they were used to that kind of uh, uh, presence. So I have to say that um, it was they have uh, facilitated a lot. Uh, my uh, engagement in asking questions. Also, they did not think it was weird to take pictures or ask questions or use the recorder. So they have made it uh, very, very uh, easy for me. But the, after that phase, I was confused about what to do with this book, why I would do it, especially considering that my audience, especially for this book, published with this publisher, written in English, would be directed to a very restricted uh, academic audience. We've discussed this a lot together, also with the inhabitants and so on. Well, uh, first thing, for starters, uh, one of the uh, requests they always had, and one of the perspectives would be that this book could be translated in Italian. 
uh, after being published uh, uh, in English. Uh, the second thing is that at some point, uh, this is something we discussed a lot uh, with uh, especially the dwellers, but also with the other fellow activists. Uh, many were losing track about uh, the scholars, anthropologists, video makers, photographers that came uh, to, to the place, right? And that would publish stuff, publish articles uh, and whatnot. They were, they were losing track of all the research that was produced and they were also, and many were also worried about uh, losing, let's say, um, connection with the, with the content or, or, or to see content that wasn't reflexive of what they felt. Together we read sometimes things that were really strange or felt strange uh, uh, in a way, right? So the idea would, would be that um, it would be good that someone that was, let's say, uh, with an insight in Metropolis would publish uh, a book that might be also uh, let's say, uh, helpful for, uh, for other scholars, uh, for helping more di directly let, and uh, for helping more directly, let's say, Metropolis, the idea, again, would be to translate the book and publish it. There are so many things I would like to add, but the idea would be to, um, to translate it. And uh, last and uh, very last uh, comment, how have I mobilized my own privileges? What besides publishing this book that was i guess a way of mobilizing my privileges uh, i've organ i tried to organize as many workshops uh, and encounters with other activist scholars uh, uh, as i could and the second thing was that many times i was asked by metropolis inhabitants to talk with researchers or people that would come to the place like they would use me as a sort of filter i would say to get to know people understand where they were coming from what they wanted or to even let's say talk to them when they would come in metropolis so this is another way that i was uh, asked to uh, use my privilege as a, a researcher who could speak english and so what and i did it so i hope i have not Forgotten. Ah, yeah. And the, and this is some and this is something very similar to how the networks are mobilized against the evictions, producing different types of materials, being there with their own bodies, whatever. So uh, that is there are many different forms of uh, being in solidarity with uh, with metropolis, and I hope that this book is one of them. Also considering that again my activism is still there and not going anywhere so probably many of the points you raised and i very thank you for that uh i will need to to develop them further because i reckon that especially uh, the points pertaining to intersectionality conflict and whatnot for, were not uh, well developed within an editorial choice of focusing on the role of metropolis uh, inside the city and for the urban commons so thank you. Uh, many thanks, Margarita. Uh, now we can open uh, the floor to the debate. Uh, we have a question uh, from, uh, uh, from the floor. Uh, I want to add uh, a short reflection on uh, uh, many of you, including the panelists, touch on the issue of, uh, of what is legal and uh, legality in a way. Uh, I want just to point out the, the, the fact that uh, it is, I think, quite intriguing in, in a way. Uh, the fact that in uh, today's uh, uh, global capitalism and especially at the urban level, uh, the, some of the most successful uh, capitalist enterprises uh, that uh, um, took shape uh, um, uh, over the last decade, I'm thinking of uh, this kind of platform uh, 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 um, uh, capitalism, uh, this kind of uh, uh, new capitalist enterprises like Airbnb, uh, Uber, are they legal? I mean, the legality of the, con uh, they, 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 they are always struggling over their legality, like Uber, Airbnb, 
so it, it's a kind of uh, I'm thinking that this informality at, the, at least in the global north was the prerogative of squatters of uh, of this kind of spaces that uh, margarita is describing is no longer a prerogative it's no longer exclusive uh, to social movements in a way but uh, quite ironically it becomes a defining feature also of the most uh, successful profit driven uh, 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 capitalist enterprises economic activities in our cities that shape deeply the urban condition. So perhaps this, uh, uh, this issue of legality is really, uh, is really key to the understanding of, the, of today's urban condition, even in the, in the global uh, north. It is perhaps, I wrote a couple of years ago a short uh, academic article uh, saying, uh, against this backdrop, uh, 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 the becoming south of the urban world, because the legality and formality was supposed to be uh, a, a characteristic of uh, southern uh, urbanism, of southern uh, uh, cities, and while now it's becoming really quite openly uh, against the backdrop of this uh, this kind of. Uh, 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 new capitalist enterprises is becoming really uh, a defining condition of the global urban condition. Uh, defining feature, sorry, of the global urban condition. So if you have some thoughts of, on, on this, uh, then we have uh, a, a, a question. Uh, I can't hear the, I can't read the, the name of the um, uh, of the commentator. Uh, great work, uh, Marguerite, and very, very interesting points raised by all panelists. I have read some of your works. I want to ask an issue that I'm also trying to figure out in my research regarding housing commons and generally housing struggles through urban commoning and the right to the city. So what about the process of institutionalization of housing commons? For example, is there a legal window in order to secure affordable and adequate uh, housing for people and their communities? In our situation, so uh, many uh, downed buildings. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if um, from the panelists themselves, uh, are, are there uh, uh, some observations, some uh, uh, short comments, please. You are, you're free. You're, uh, I really invite you to to make these comments. Also, um, replying to to Margarita. To, uh, yeah. Uh, so he, uh, the, the the last sentence of the written comment uh, read uh, abandoned building. So. I thought many told me it was a word that I didn't know in English, but it was actually a misspell. It was actually a type of uh, abandoned buildings. So, okay. Perhaps Elsa? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think, um, you know, I mean, it depends on, on, on the context, of course, the legal context of, of where you're located um, and, and what the specific laws are that, are that govern um, housing. but. But one um, thing that's often considered, you know, squatter's law or legal loophole in, in at least the U.S. context and also um, in Europe is, is around adverse possession, which allows for squatters to gain ownership of um, squatted buildings for after they have uh, squatted. Uh, well, I guess there's different um, requirements in different um um, in, in different areas, but in the US, it's um, around 14 and a half years on average that you have to maintain a squatted space um, and maintain borders and maintain control over that space. But um, adverse possession is, so there's like a, a specific window for holding that space. Um, but I, but this also sort of, um, to reflect on what you were just saying, Ugo, and some of the um, comments that you were making, Margarita, around this question of legalization, I just wanted to pick up on was just about how um, how, how 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 different forms of illegal forms of housing and development are treated differently. 
um, both over time and across, um, you know, um, sort of more, more capitalist or middle class forms of informal housing versus um, more political projects of squatting, but also how, you know, even with the historical trajectory of squatting, for example, like in the US where squatting was actually encouraged, encouraged as a means of colonial expansion um, in the West and so was supported by courts for a long time for a long time and adverse things like adverse possession were or sort of held up but then with sort of the concretization of private property it's now the courts have sort of turned the opposite direction in terms of uh, making it more difficult for for forms of um uh, uh squatting and, and and illegal development so just even how um how different forms of of illegal and informal housing are treated across jurisdictions is also um political uh, and has changed over time and across different geographies too. Thanks, Elsa. Anyone else? Amanda? Miguel raised uh, Miguel? Ah, okay. Sorry, I didn't see it. <laughs> well, um, one of the questions I had also in my notes was related to the assemblies, since you emphasize now the, the centrality of the assembly for as the venue, as the political space, gathering place, also to um, deal with conflicts. But, um, but I noticed uh, big differences in when comparing social centers, the squat social centers and, and housing squats. Because um, I mean the rules change, and and also the um, behaviors, the patterns regarding who is attending and who is taking roles within the assembly may change very much. But um, metropolis is a sort of hybrid space, and um, but it's so diverse that I I guess that assemblies cannot be easy, and that not everyone is attending assemblies. <laughs> So how can you manage also because you need um, to do politics in your daily life beyond the assembly. The assembly is a very politicized sort of um, configuration within a squad and is crucial for the vibrancy of an, a common. But you also need to, to keep good relationships with people to share, to cooperate in many other aspects beyond the assembly. Right. So even when people don't attend assemblies, you need to do something. So perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about this story of your observations of the, the work in assemblies and beyond the assemblies in order to, um, <clears throat> to keep your argument that the assembly is so central uh, for this political structure. No, that's, that's thanks. May I? Yes, please. Um, as for this last point, uh, actually, uh, the assemblies that are made in spaces like metropolis are not very similar to those of social centers. Uh, as you said, they, uh, the assemblies that we think of when we uh, in configurations of spaces like social centers are very politicized and are very ritual in a way, of course, also the uh, assemblies in places like metropolis have rites and rituals of their own, but let's say that usually they work by um, first part, let's say the beginning, I mean, uh, ordinary assembly we're speaking of, right? We are not speaking about assemblies that are made when something very serious occurs uh, on an internal or the external level. I'm speaking about the ordinary management, uh, if we could say so. So uh, the beginning would be updates on the general situation that is never very static. So it would be sharing like news, political news, what happened with that other squad that was uh, uh, evicted, nearly evicted, what's going on, let's say, out outside. So there are like these updates. 
Then, of course, in the case of metropolis, there is also a further layer that connects also to the point again of social centers that is uh, discussing about events that are planned because there is, uh, as I say in the book, uh, another uh, assembly for where, let's say, um, the museum's uh, uh, calendar is uh, is made but ultimately it's the uh, overall assembly of the inhabitants that I have to discuss if an initiative is okay uh, or not so in, in proposals of events are discussed and then people can say whatever they want which can be any type of argument from the lamest one we have had an argument uh, because uh, uh, that party was uh, was too loud. Uh, these people have uh, their dogs running over everywhere, and they uh, they have beaten my cat. These kind of topics, I mean, are discussed on a very regular basis. Or I have an argument with this dude because he was drunk. He told he said me he told me that he told me so. So they could be very noisy, not very orderly, no ritual, and, and usually you get out of these assemblies with a very large headache and you feel like, oh, oh my God, I'm not doing this anymore, but you do it every time again, because that's what you need to do. And about the events, actually, uh, you are right, Miguel, actually, uh, uh, let's say Metropolis would have the potentiality to be very similar to a social center and to host events uh, like, uh, uh, let's say, uh, concerts uh, or the type of social centers, uh, big events. Actually, this was experimented at the very beginning of Metropolis. Then these kind of events were discontinued because they are too, uh, they are too loud, because uh, uh, people who come there do not understand that people do live in there. So they are not going to a rape party in an abandoned factory. They're going in a place where families live. So they were too difficult to, to manage. Uh, so they were discontinued and the type of events that the museum hosts uh, are very uh, different, are done usually in uh, day hours uh, or they finish at a very early uh, time at night. And this was an example of an agreement that had to be uh, found and that makes it very different also from a social center configuration. Yeah. Ah, oh, sorry, I forgot to reply to one question. I will be very quick on this one about emulations of metropolis, if there are any. Not, not in Rome, not that I'm aware of, but uh, other housing squads have, have different types uh, of uh, uh, autonomous infrastructures of their own. So some have their own library, others have uh, art labs, uh, others may have self-managed theaters. So places have different facilities based on the nature of the structure, because not everyone has such a gigantic space where they could do uh, plenty, plenty of things, uh, and based also on internal needs, uh, on their relationship with the neighborhood. Uh, so, uh, no, we don't have an exact replica, but we have examples of how this model of housing uh, and uh, creating further commons could be uh, and is replicated, actually. Thanks, Margarita. Uh, there is more, uh, one more question. I think it is from Manuel Lutz. Uh, thanks a lot for a uh, promising book and very insightful comments. I've not read the book, but I would like to know more how uh, it helps us to understand housing commons of poor people beyond the case study, but actually define such housing commons or are all the housing struggle that feature occupation, informality, and collectivity adequately conceptualized as commons. While it may be politically strategic to mainstream the notion of commons, I wonder about the inflationary use of this fuzzy concept. Curious to hear comments uh, by all of you. Uh, perhaps uh, if you have uh, really one, two million questions, uh, answer. Is it a fuzzy concept, the commons? Just a very brief reply well it is and it has been co-opted also on uh, let's by uh, also transnational institutions and whatnot so yes it can be 
a tricky or a fuzzy concept. That's exactly why I think we might want to focus on, uh, uh, let's say, the relational side of the, of the commons and also not so much uh, on the issue of uh, uh, ownership, because I think that's uh, another uh, problem, especially with the Italian debate about the, com the commons, the problem of uh, uh, ownership and the problem of state management. There are things that are commons that, uh, I mean, are not defined by their ownership status, nor by the fact of being managed by the state. And here I am referring uh, to what happened, for instance, with the water referendum in Italy and the whole consequent debate about the commons. So that's what I was thinking. And also about the fact, and I mean, the question would deserve a very long answer. I would just stop by saying that I think that beyond the case study, the case of Metropolis, which is, which is particularly unique, but as I said, there are 70 other housing squats in Rome that could be investigated, discussed, questioned or whatnot, can speak to, to the fact that, again, there are uh, pieces of the city that were considered uh, unproductive, unvaluable, that were abandoned, that have... Uh, been transformed, repurposed, and became so much more of people, for people who were in need uh, of housing, which means that, again, housing and the urban space uh, can, may not be evaluated according to their market value, but for the use that, that people make of them. So that would be another point, I think, that is relevant to the commons debate. Uh, thanks, Margarita. I'm not sure if there is uh, any very quick uh, observation. And uh, otherwise, I think we can end here our conversation that was great and inspiring in uh, my mind. So really, thanks again to Elsa, Miguel and uh, Amanda for joining us uh, virtually here at the Grand Sasso Science Institute. And thanks for all the participants, all the attendees in this uh, um, in this uh, webinar, and of course, thanks to to Margarita for writing this book and uh, for uh, uh, for uh, this uh, conversation. Okay, thank you, and um, thank you, everyone. I, I hope I will see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. 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 -bye. Thank you. 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 Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.